Thanks for uh, sticking around, everyone. It's been uh, a long two days for me, waiting for this final slot uh, to happen. We've heard some of the previous speakers say that we don't need another C2, and AI and cyber is mostly bullshit at the moment. So I will be speaking about a C2 making use of AI. Um, so about me, I'm, uh, my name is Jonas. I work for Enviso, a European uh, cybersecurity firm which was uh, started in Belgium. Um, I am the uh, solution lead for Benelux, at least, for our ARES solution, which is a, a cool acronym for Adversarial Risk Emulation and Simulation. Um, together with my uh, German colleague, a German solution lead for the DAG region, we have about 13 uh, dedicated red team operators. And we mainly do uh, target-driven testing, so that's mostly red teaming, purple teaming, cyber engagements, but also the, the things we call non-stealth uh, red teams or scenario-based pen testing for the customers that want to do red teams but are not quite there yet in terms of uh, maturity. So for this talk, I've got a, a short introduction on uh, GPT, uh, which is obligatory, uh, I think. And then um, we'll go into the implants that we created, uh, the proof of concept, uh, show some capabilities. We'll have a look at uh, drawbacks and possible ways to improve that. And then finally, uh, look if it's actually practically usable uh, and what the future options or, or possibilities might be. So first of all, introduction. Um, yeah, GPT has been uh, massively popular lately. Um, we'll first be looking at some more general offensive purposes and then yeah, dive more and more into the, the malware and implant uh, section. So I think for uh, penetration testing in general, it has been useful to help people with creating specific commands, like asking uh, how should I do a SQL injection and it gives you the exact command that you have to run it can tell you how to execute uh, specific tools. There is a very nice tool called Pentest GPT that you may or may not have seen yet, um, which has been tested against some hacked box uh, systems. And it basically uh, guides you through uh, pen testing a hack the box system where you tell it, look, I have this IP I want to target, and it will give you uh, basically the workflow for attacking that. So it will tell you this is what you can run first, this is what you can run after. Uh, when you run those commands and you give it the output, uh, then it will actually guide you on like, more specific things to try. Like if you have some open ports, it will tell you this port you could try, this or that perhaps, maybe this has this specific CVE. So it's basically holding your hand while you do a, a pen test against a box. Um, secondly, for social engineering or phishing purposes, it has also been quite useful. It can help you write uh, convincing phishing emails if it does not want to because it's uh, not ethically allowed to, you can just ask it to write a business email and then use that for phishing purposes. It can help you write uh, reports. So this is an example of a, a finding linked to uh, LLM and R relaying, which is a, a bit of a classic penetration testing finding and it does quite a good job at um, describing what the finding is, what the risk rating is. Recommendations, they didn't fit on the screen anymore but they made sense actually, so it is quite useful to help you with that. And source code analysis, of course, if you give it a piece of code, then it can tell you uh, what kind of vulnerabilities it may have, uh, where it might have issues to execute or compile, for example. Um, so very useful in general for offensive things. Then taking it a step further, uh, if we look at malware development, so here I asked it to write uh, a snippet of code in C++ to do process injection. It's um, a quite traditional way to do it, so open a process, allocate some memory, write a shell code in it, create remote threads. It didn't work out of the box, but at least it gives you a good idea on how to do it or to start fine-tuning it so you can actually get it to work. And then we have some very concrete examples already, which are also inspiration for, for what we've been doing here. Um, implants making use of GPT. The first one is uh, Black Mamba by Jeff Sims. They're both Python-based. Um, what it does specifically, this one, is uh, just keylogging. So it um, has a flow where it generates code, asking GPT to provide it a piece of code for keylogging. It will then execute that code and send the output to the uh, operator via Teams, and it will generate uh, different code every time. But it has a, a very specifically crafted prompt, so 
the, the, the author uh, has to ask it specifically, generate the code using these functions, uh, definitely don't use this or that. So it's very fine-tuned for that specific task. And then there is uh, another example, Chatty Katy or, or Chatty Katy uh, by uh, CyberArk. And this one is uh, focused on keylogging, encryption, and persistence. It's also uh, open source, so there is a repository for it. I did not get it to, to work, um, so that uh, I couldn't test it really. And they also don't provide the specific prompts. So yeah, all in all, not much you can use directly with, uh, with that repository. Um, but both of these got me then thinking, like, what if we would use this for, uh, for a C2? So with that, uh, setting the scene uh, for this, the idea was, uh, could we actually use this to uh, create a command and control framework? Um, if so, then uh, does it properly work? Are there downsides that make it impossible to use? Um, so what we have here is a, a small proof of concept with some ideas on how it could be modified uh, in the future. Now, we did not replace our good old Cobalt Strike with a chatbot, uh, nor the more recent Cobalt Strike alternatives, so we are still using those uh, as a C2. Um, we also did not want to release an operational C2, and uh, I know everyone likes uh, open source code or having something to play with, but we did not really see the, the benefit in uh, providing the code because it is quite simple to reproduce, I would say, and it also would not um, help with making the community more resilient. Uh, it might just be included in other C2 frameworks and abused potentially. So um, we're not releasing anything, at least not at this moment. So now looking at the implant that, uh, that we created, in terms of requirements, I wanted it to be um, using a, a simple programming language um, that I, as a, a simple Red Team Manager, could uh, even use or, or play around with. Uh, it should be easy to execute code at runtime because what you will do is ask a module to a GPT at runtime and then try to execute that in your implant. And it would be nice if we could uh, reuse some of the existing code that we have lying around just to reduce the uh, development effort. So we uh, ended up with C-sharp, which is everyone's favorite language, of course, uh, especially for hackers, and that's what we uh, set out to work with. So the first very basic implementation is just um, a program that is running locally, um, so no, or, or, yeah, no C2 capabilities at the moment yet. I was just executing that in my command prompt and typing into the program. Um, it would, uh, with the provided command, reach out to uh, OpenAI, which uh, is an implementation that we had running in our Azure environment. So uh, we have a dedicated labs team that uh, was friendly enough to set this up for me on a quite short notice. I think same day that I asked or, or told them, hey, I would like to play around with this. They provided me with an API key and some endpoints and I could get started. Um, made use of the, uh, the SDK that is available that you see there, it's Betalgo OpenAI. Um, so what the uh, tool would do is um, when I put in my command, ask uh, GPT for a module. For example, you tell it to list running processes. It would send that command to um, OpenAI and then retrieve a piece of code as a result and then put that piece of code into compile assembly from source. And that is something that is uh, available in C Sharp where you can just give it, um, as it says, a, a piece of source code and then it will compile that into an assembly and you can uh, execute that at runtime um, in your application. And after doing that, it would then yeah, send the output so what it did back to uh, me as an operator. So the first challenge was uh, getting the prompt right. I don't know, I think it's quite readable. Um, so you see at the top, I added make sure to end this statement with a dot because that was quite crucial for the way we interacted uh, at this point. Uh, we used the completion API. So if you do not end it with a dot, uh, what it would do is complete your sentence for you and for example tell you uh, and display their associated process IDs. So uh, every time I forgot ending it with a dot, the program would not work and I would wonder why and that's why I added it explicitly in my uh, request. Um, when you do end it with a dot, it interprets your sentence as completed and it will provide you a, a nice piece of code um, for which you can see the example here. Um, in terms of structure, 
uh, the, the prompt is specifically uh, created to have a namespace for GPT, uh, call the class program, and then have an empty main method, um, just to have some fixed structure in the code that you're requesting and to be able to run it uh, reflectively at runtime. Now, in terms of uh, models or APIs to use, I mentioned we started out with the completion API. Um, that is actually the, the legacy one. So um, up until a few weeks ago, I was using that one and then changed it to chat completion, which is now a more recent version. Um, also recommended because I think completion um, has been deprecated around, uh, I think, August or something. Um, it also does not support the GPT 3.5 module. So uh, they mostly differ in terms of uh, token size, uh, in terms of cost per request, but also capabilities. So the, the GPT 3.5 should be more performant. And then uh, practically, completion only allows to provide a, a single very simple prompt where it will complete that prompt. And for chat completion, you can have uh, full-on conversations um, where you apply different roles. So you can tell the system uh, or the bot, um, you are now a helpful coding assistant. That's the, the system role. And then as a user, you ask it a request and it will answer with uh, an assistance uh, uh, specific uh, piece in the API. And there you can uh, take your code out of. So uh, there the idea came as an ideal architecture. Uh, like what if we just use these conversations? So do not have any traditional command and control framework uh, where we could, as an operator, ask in conversation one to do a, a specific task or generate a module. Uh, which the implant would then be able to retrieve in that same conversation. And then the implant could uh, send the output uh, into another conversation. And there you could, as an operator, um, retrieve the result and maybe even some suggested actions that the uh, AI came up with itself. So that was the, uh, basically the ideal scenario. Um, the problem is you cannot use a conversation ID. So Every time you start a conversation, you do a request, you get uh, your response back, of course. It contains a conversation ID, but you cannot use that in any way um, to request a next conversation or, or as a reference in another um, source or in the implant. So basically every time in the conversation, you need to put everything as context, um, which makes it a bit more difficult to uh, implement the architecture as such. So then we had to come up with uh, an alternative. And uh, here, that's the, the part where we reused some existing code. Um, that's my colleague, uh, Wiebe Willems, who's also somewhere in the audience, but I haven't. Uh, he's waving there. Hi, Wiebe. Um, he created his own uh, C2 called Wiebe Willems C2 or W2C2 um, based on a course by uh, Rasta Mouse by uh, Zero Point Security. And in a, a short time, he actually created something working properly, um, so I continued on, on that um, and basically built then command GPT with his base to start from. He was also friendly enough to build a nice uh, UI, the command GPT UI uh, that you see on the bottom right here. So now the architecture uh, that we're working with is you have your operator, they uh, interact with the uh, team server, the command GPT team server, which then sends the command to the implant uh, the implant will reach out to uh, GPT to uh, request a module. It will get the module back and then execute that at runtime. Um, the output is then sent back to the team server and the operator interacting with it. So here you again have your traditional C2 channel. So it's not possible to, uh, yeah, to avoid that with, with this setup, um, but that is what we uh, set out then to uh, work with or to continue with. So how that looks in the uh, C2 framework is uh, on the, for you, left side, but for me, left side as well, uh, actually. Uh, on the left side, you have your uh, commands that are built into the C2. So what you would typically have is all the commands, all the post-exploitation steps that you want to perform um, are uh, pre, uh, pre-programmed. Um, and then as an operator, you would type in, for example, uh, list directory that would call this specific module and execute it. But now you can replace all of those with just one single module uh, called, in this case, GPT, which takes your command and then um, gets a module at runtime. There are 
yeah, in addition to these uh, pre-programmed things, other ways that you can uh, add functionality at runtime, like execute assembly in Cobalt Strike, or using beacon object files, and with that you could extend this idea or this capability to that as well, and for example, uh, generate your beacon object files at runtime. Um, but for this proof of concept, it's a, a bit simpler and just using uh, C Sharp. So what that looks like um, is, for example, what you see here. So on the left, we have the uh, implant. The operator asks uh, list running processes. And then on the right, um, yeah, the output is enabled to, to give you a better view. You see the uh, piece of code that is generated and then the output. So uh, GPT is nice enough to um, add a, a little process and then uh, the exact process name and the process ID. So that's just himself uh, adding this or, or uh, formatting the output uh, for you. In terms of capabilities, some of the things that we were able to do is um, yeah, listing files, downloading files, looking at user accounts, uh, local administrators, encrypting files, changing the desktop background. So a lot of things that are uh, quite typical ransomware behavior. Um, so that then got us thinking, what if we just ask it to generate uh, a module or, or source code that performs um, our evil emulation this, uh, that uses their specific DTPs. And here it starts getting a bit delusional. So it says, yeah, for uh, our evil, let's just load their library of DTPs and then execute those. Now, unfortunately, they don't have a, a library available, so that is not uh, successfully executed yet. So then we set out to uh, running some of these uh, manually ourselves, uh, have a small emulation plan to try that. And for this, we have some videos that should start automatically, yes. I think that's also quite visible, but the command is um, show the system's keyboard settings. That's um, a typical check that many uh, ransomware uh, applications do to validate uh, whether or not the target is uh, Eastern European or Russian, for example after which they would uh, abort execution. So here, when they see uh, it's uh, United States, they would get uh, a good to go for uh, ransoming. Um, the output is not shown yet on the right side because I cut the video short. Uh, you will see it on the next one normally. Yes, so here we get the output back. And then type in the next command. Um, here we ask it to check the running processes, and if calculator is running, it prints, or it has to print danger. Now, calculator is not uh, very risky by itself, so what you would want here is maybe uh, Defender or CrowdStrike or any other EDR, and if that is running, uh, maybe sleep for a longer period of time. Then as a next step, we can enumerate the folders in the user's desktop to uh, see if anything interesting is there for ransoming. Um, yeah, we see there is one that says uh, important, so that might be an interesting target. What we will do here is then ask it to encrypt all of the files in there with, uh, we're keeping it simple, an XOR uh, with key uh, just A. Um, here you see the file in the folder, it's confidential.txt. Um, I'm a bit impatient in refreshing, uh, as you can see. And what it does is uh, rewrite it to uh, ARES as an extension and then it should uh, XOR the contents. So let's have a look at the contents. I'll pause it here for a, a second as well, because you can see not a lot changed in the file itself. Um, but if you look closely, it did actually change just the first character. Um, it's quite easy to explain, because when we continue and have a look at the actual code, yeah, there you can see the code it generated is checking for the key length, and if the uh, yeah, the uh, index is uh, below that, it will do the change, and if not, it will not. So after the first character, it stopped encryption. So yeah, it's uh, it's not there yet in terms of capabilities, but uh, trust me, we have been able to encrypt folders with it. And then as a, a final step, um, what we wanted to do is create a ransom node. So we're asking it to download the contents from Pastebin and then store it uh, on the desktop as ransom.txt. So here the ransom is uh, created, the text file. I'm again too quick to open it to see uh, the contents. And then it's just 
showing up before I wanted to press close. So here it is again uh, to see the contents. It's, uh, I think, an example of um, a lockbit ransom note. So that's a, a short uh, emulation plan, you might be uh, able to call it. That's uh, executed with the command GPT ID. Now, looking at some of the drawbacks and possible improvements. Um, first of all, it creates temporary files. Um, with the compile assembly from source, you can add compiler options. You see some of those uh, on the top left. Whether you say generate in memory is true or false, it's still creating those temporary files. I haven't figured out why that is or if that's actually avoidable, uh, but the temporary files do get created. The only thing I could change is whether it should ex uh, generate an executable or a DLL. So you see in the, as the temporary files on the left, a DLL being created, on the right an executable. Now this is based on uh, static detections. The uh, module that we requested here was to uh, perform process injection, to just uh, to generate uh, some shellcode with uh, the traditional process injection, and this was uh, detected by Defender. Of course, if you use more uh, innocent things like listing processes or listing folders, then it doesn't get detected, so that's um, a downside here. Um, you might consider uh, encryption of the source code to avoid that. Um, I tried asking GPT to uh, encrypt the source code before giving it back to me, but that was a complete disaster, so that did not work. Um, even if you would uh, encrypt it yourself uh, at runtime, it's, it's um, compiling the executable and uh, using it directly after, so you cannot encrypt it before using it, and. Uh, this, um, yeah, these detections are, are therefore unavoidable um, if the temporary files at least are uh, statically signatured. Then another uh, opportunity for detection is um, yeah, just the fact that it compiles after delivery. So that's a, a specific uh, MITRE technique even. So if you have a, a detection or a detection case for that technique, then you would be able to detect any module basically that it tries to uh, execute. So you can see that it calls uh, csc.exe uh, for compiling the module. Um, you can also mark uh, temporary files to be kept or stored. So I checked that just to see uh, what kind of files it has temporarily. And it has the uh, source code in the .cs. It shows you what command line it is running. Uh, it shows you the specific parameters that it's adding. So yeah, with the, the architecture that we have here, this is also um, unavoidable and a good opportunity for detection of this uh, specific approach. Then dependencies was also a big uh, pain in the ass. Um, every model, module that you want to generate, um, you can add specific dependencies that it references or that it wants to use. So there is, uh, again, the compiler parameters that you can use for that. Um, either you have to just through trial and error, see what it generates, what kind of libraries you need, and then hard code all of those. So it, it kind of defeats the purpose of generating at runtime. Um, as an alternative, uh, what I did was checking the, the source code it returns, so looking at the, the using pattern to see what kind of libraries it wants to use, and then um, add those as a referenced assembly. That works nice as long as you use just the, the default libraries that are available. If you use things that would have to be installed through NuGet, for example, then uh, your code will not work uh, on the target. So yeah, compiling on the target and relying on uh, libraries that are available on the target are also a downside of this approach. And then source code that uh, yeah, just does not work, that contains errors, was another issue. Two main issues I saw were uh, compiler errors, so when trying to compile it with compile assembly from source, and then uh, reflection errors when actually trying to execute it. Uh, those would lead to a frozen implant. So I started implementing some error handling. The first version was um, yeah, quite dumb error handling because when an error occurred, I would just uh, request the same thing again and, and try to uh, get a different module, hoping for a better result. Um, that was not always very successful. So the improved error handling is um, it is using the context that you can provide to that conversation, to that chat completion. So when uh, a module would error, I would uh, start a new request. 
give it the source code that it had generated before, but also the specific error that, uh, that occurred, and then ask it, based on this source code and this error, can you give me something that actually works? And this was, uh, in terms of error handling, an improvement, also something that worked uh, at times at least. So here's an example where I ask it to create a scheduled task. Um, execution fails and it's giving me an error that says you must add a reference to a specific assembly, so uh, a missing dependency. Um, in the next uh, iteration, I gave that uh, code back to GPT with the specific error, and then it says, ah yes, of course, the code was missing a dependency declaration. I have added that for you. Um, we execute it again, and then you can see that the, the scheduled task is getting created. So looking at the uh, initial architecture that we had, where the uh, operator interacts with the team server, the team server then with the implant, and the implant getting uh, the module through the conversation, we could come up with uh, a slightly improved architecture, um, where you add an intermediate step, uh, some kind of building system, for example, um, and where you, as an operator, then interact with the team server. The team server could itself request the module that you want to execute and send it to your building system where you have complete control so you can avoid any uh, detections, any alerts there. Uh, you can compile the assembly and if you want, you could even encrypt it, uh, after which you can then provide the encrypted assembly to your implant where the implant will decrypt it and then uh, execute it reflectively. Um, there is a good resource on reflection uh, through uh, SANS, so there is a, a workshop there. It's um, given by a former colleague and, and friend, uh, well, former colleague and still current friend, uh, Jean-Francois Maas. So if you have a look at that, it's um, already giving you a good chunk of what you would need to build out this uh, architecture. And here, yeah, you have the benefit that you can Looking at the next slide, you have the benefit that you decouple uh, compilation from your target, um, so you don't have to uh, do that there and yeah, risk getting detected specifically for that technique. You have your temporary files on your own builder system. You can uh, make sure to install dependencies, at least after uh, trying a module and then seeing that it's missing dependencies. You could make sure that they're available, that you can compile there. And you could even uh, retry your source code multiple times until it does exactly what you want it to do. Um, and then uh, after that, deliver the assembly to the implant. Now the, the, con, uh, the bad part here is that um, yeah, you're basically completely back to traditional uh, C2 because there is no more link between your implant and um, the GPT. So now you have your team server. Um, communicating with that and you again have to send your post-exploitation modules to your implant through uh, another traditional uh, uh, C2 channel. So here you miss uh, making use of that trusted connection with uh, OpenAI or Azure, um, which is of course a, a downside. So in terms of uh, practical use and, and future options, we uh, have thought of some things. Um, I think a first interesting one is uh, teaching concepts, basically, because you're making use of just uh, natural language. Um, so if you can form uh, a sentence, then you can start uh, being a red team operator. That probably still excludes some people, but I think it includes uh, more people uh, that way. Um, you could use it to teach uh, kids red team concepts, for example. Uh, Logbit might start introducing boot camps, as you see on the right, to create an army of 12-year-old red teamers. I also gave them little track suits uh, to stay in the team. Um, it could facilitate playbooks for post-exploitation. Instead of having a playbook that says, run this command specifically, run that specifically, and then check this or that, you could make it more generic um, and, and just have natural language again. Um, as an example, you can see, yeah, check the processes, and if Windows Defender is running, tell me. So that's a more relevant uh, one compared to before. Whereas if you have the specific command, you would say, yeah, do a, a task list, look at the output, validate whether this or that is running. Um, so it lowers the hurdle to probably start uh, operating as a, as a red teamer. Then the malicious actors, yeah, you can be sure that uh, this concept, uh, they would take it further than we as a red team can do. Um, we cannot use this in, in a production environment, I would say, because we don't want to run unknown 
code uh, in a customer's environment. We don't know what exactly will be generated, but as a, a ransomware group, you probably don't really care about uh, what you're going to run in a target environment. Um, they also have very uh, specific uh, purposely built modules uh, or models um, on the dark web. Uh, some of the examples I've seen floating around is Fraud GPT, Worm GPT, and, and many others, which are specifically aimed at doing naughty stuff, so generating code, generating phishing emails. Um, you could build these very specifically to help in creating these post-exploitation modules and also automating the steps. So you could train that model, model, uh, that model with uh, modules that you successfully executed, where you said, look, at this uh, piece of code, that's uh, a go, this was successful, this was not successful, so maybe don't use that in the future. So you could really uh, train the module on knowing what would work or what would not work. Um, you could also train it on evasion. We used just a, a generic model, um, so yeah, the encryption, uh, like I said, did not work uh, very well, but you could train it with uh, ways to do encryption, for example, uh, or with evasion information, where you say this, uh, uh, this piece of code worked against CrowdStrike, but did not work against uh, Defender. Uh, and like that, you could build a, a very useful model um, to help with, uh, with these kind of post-exploitation steps. Now, another uh, proof of concept that is uh, actually already uh, released or working is um, iSpy. So it's by uh, Jeff Sims, uh, the same person who made Black Mamba. It is actually also written in C-sharp and also makes use of compile assembly uh, from source. So uh, somewhere the, the previous weeks, uh, around the same time we uh, submitted this talk, they came with uh, the same proof of concept. Um, so it's interesting to see that they went the same route with how to execute this, uh, this stuff at runtime. Um, the implementation is a bit different though because it's not implemented as uh, command and control. It is uh, designed to be autonomous basically where as a first step, it generates code to enumerate processes, and then based on that output, based on that list, it will start looking at uh, next steps that it can do. And the, the three things that are implemented is capturing uh, audio, capturing the clipboard, or taking screenshots. Uh, so it's yeah, very much focused on, on these steps. And based on those three things, it will look at uh, the processes that are running and which can be abused. So if you have WebEx running, for example, it might decide to um, uh, capture audio. If it sees key pass, it could decide to capture the clipboard. So it's um, a bit of a different idea, but uh, a similar implementation. And then the, the final uh, idea, the one that we think is um, yeah. the, the most valuable or interesting for us, is um, going the, the purple mode. So something I've been playing around with was ingesting threat intelligence, so putting a, a threat intelligence report uh, into the chatbot and then asking it to, based on that report, generate a, a small emulation plan for the specific threat actor. Uh, the benefit here is it's natural language. Um, you can process the natural language in the threat intel report and generate your list uh, with natural language as well. Um, so you could uh, basically take that output and just uh, put it directly in command GPT, having it execute all of those different steps. Um, as an emulation plan, it, is, uh, it, it works well because your detections, you want to have them uh, more abstract, so not on the specific operational things that it executes, but on the techniques. Uh, and that's exactly what you would get with the natural language from that uh, emulation plan. Now, if you take it, a step further, if you would really uh, start yeah, building a module, uh, a model that's um, uh, that's built for this purpose, um, you could try to have it decide on an agent to use. So, imagine you've got multiple agents running on different systems. Um, you have checked in with those agents and, uh, and determined uh, system names. For example, uh, it could be called SQL or Web or. or certain application servers. Based on that information, it could start making decisions on what to do next or which system to attack for which specific purpose next. Um, you could also have it execute uh, some kind of uh, smoke screen where if your target is one system, uh, it automatically decides to generate some noise on another system just to validate specific detections. 
Um, it could also include maybe uh, legitimate information, legitimate metadata, where if you told it you're targeting uh, customer ABC, uh, it would look at um, the, the website of customer ABC, for example, or suppliers that they use, and uh, start using that in naming conventions uh, for your payloads, for example, just to yeah, make it seem a bit more legitimate. Um, you could generate multiple implementations, so if you execute a, a specific technique, um, I'll take again the example of listing processes. You could have uh, one uh, piece of code returned in C-sharp to execute that, but you could also have it returned in, in different formats to execute with different lolbins, for example, which gets uh, very interesting when, when you try to uh, emulate specific steps and want to check if your detections not just work on one thing operationally, but really on the level of the technique and, and different implementations. Um, this takes away effort from uh, an operator that has to look at a threat intel report or has to create an emulation plan and then execute all of those steps manually so it can uh, facilitate that. At some point it might be even smart enough to make decisions itself and yeah, make it so that red team operators are no longer needed. Uh, then we can start looking for different hobbies. But with the input, uh, or what I saw at the moment, I, I don't think we're there yet. So. In terms of future options, um, the, the purple idea, the emulation plan idea, is personally something I think is, is most interesting and something that we will probably be looking into uh, in the near uh, future as well. So in conclusion, uh, I think it's, uh, as a proof of concept, it, it worked out. It is possible to use large language models in uh, combination with C2 to execute specific pieces of code, to, to generate those at runtime. Um, just generating that code is, is just the beginning, so there are many different things that you can start doing, like obfuscation, uh, different evasion techniques that you can start implementing. Uh, and I think it's, um, as many other people have mentioned today, the uh, AI and, and generation um, provide a lot of opportunities for automation uh, in the future. Um, which will help out the, uh, the red teams, but can also greatly help out malicious actors in um, facilitating or uh, reducing the, the runtime of their operations and making it more difficult for, uh, for blue teamers. And with that, I, uh, I thank you for uh, staying until the very end. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's loud. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, uh, as a red team. Uh, if you're using this, do you want to run code in your agent where you're not completely sure what the code is that you're running because you want to stay silent and maybe the, uh, the chatbot <laughs> thinks of something that you don't want to run in that environment? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> not just for staying silent, but just in general running things that you don't know uh, beforehand in a production environment uh, against customers is not something I would be comfortable with. Um, so to deal with that, you could use the other architecture ID where you first build it on your site and maybe properly validate it, although that uh, defeats a bit the idea of generating at runtime and, and reducing the time it takes to perform uh, a task. But uh, no, I would not, uh, not do that. That's also why I think the, the purple teaming ID is a bit more interesting, where you could uh, set up a specific test system uh, to do that. Um, besides that, when you look at those uh, custom-created models, there is, I saw an example of a, a module, or, or a model, the model module is a bit complicated, a model uh, being like backdoored somehow with uh, fake information, so that when you ask it a question about just a specific fact, it would reply with that incorrect information. So. If you would use a model that's backdoored in that way to execute a malicious actor's code, you might get a piece of source code back that, uh, in addition to what you're trying to accomplish, 
runs another uh, piece of code that you uh, did not expect and that gives uh, another actor access as well. So no, I, I would not use it in the production. Thanks.